yeah, uh, thank you for for having me. Um, first of all, I have to really say I'm sorry for for my voice. It's my third uh, conference this week. Uh, I've been in London. I've been in Antwerp. Um, there was unfortunately not a chance to make it uh, to Taiwan in person. Um, you know, time zones and stuff and uh, prices are really complicated. But I'm really happy to be here anyways. And I hope you can hear me well, even though my correct voice. <clears throat> So um, a few words about me. I'm Chris. Um, forget the last name. It's a German thing. Uh, you don't have to try to pronounce that. Uh, it's just Chris. I've uh, been with a couple of companies over the cast, last couple of years. I'm coming from a strong engineering background. Um, and I've done a lot of backend engineering, um, either at Ubisoft. And you may know Ubisoft for one reason or another. Most of the time, people know it for their uh, crappy ideas on how copy protection is supposed to work. Um, but I think in the Java space, most people know me from my time at Hazelcast, probably, um, or even Stana. Um, after leaving in Stana uh, due to the acquisition from, from IBM, I had my own startup for, uh, for a while, for about three years or so. And we created um, hot and software for uh, animal barns. So basically measuring temperature, um, humidity, ammonia levels, stuff like that and try to correlate it to, to increase animal welfare. That was the idea. And we used Timescale as an underlying database for the time series database. So I ended up at Timescale um, that I left about two weeks ago. Um, so when I when I submitted that, I was still at Timescale. Now I'm not. Um, right now, uh, you are, uh, including the other two conferences, you are the first ones to see me as a free person. Um, all right, that is enough. We have a lot to talk about today. So let's, let's get going. Um, you don't have to completely understand that right now. That was basically the infrastructure um, or the architecture of the software at my own startup. And we will look at that um, at the end of the session to, to see a few patterns uh, that during the session I will basically introduce. Um, so since I can't uh, do like the hands thing, um, I expect there's some people that already know a few terms or have worked with stream processing, event processing, uh, complex event processing, those kinds of things. But there's always people that don't. So uh, we're, we're starting bottom up, um, very, very basic. Um, and in the end, we'll, we will uh, introduce all the patterns. But first of all, I mean, we're engineers. We, we know, know that we love to create new terms, also new terms for existing technologies. We love to rebrand stuff. Um, but at the same time, as engineers, we also know one of the hardest things next to character encoding and time zones uh, is finding good terms. Um, probably one of the reasons why we keep reinventing those. Um, so I brought a few pattern, or a few terms that um, are around to understand stream processing, event processing, CDC, all those kinds of things. Some of them mean the same things. Uh, many of them sound very familiar, but to mean to the total opposite. Uh, some are patterns, some are more broader kind of things. It's it's really complicated. So let's go through them one by one, right? Uh, but before that, um, let's let's back out a little bit and and see why are we actually talking about all of that, right? Um, what we create these days are something that I love to call modern applications. Modern applications have three big important uh, characteristics. They're elastic, so they can scale up and down. They're responsive. Uh, a user's, from a user's perspective, a user doesn't like to wait 10 seconds to do something, right? The, the UI needs to be responsive, the system needs to be responsive, except for you booking flights. And I'm not sure if you're familiar with how flight booking works, but imagine basically a Telnet-based um, a Telnet based API, that's what they call it. Um, so you connect to some something like a Telnet server, uh, pass in some characters, some magic things, and you get eventually a uh, result out of it. It's it's a really old, really, well, crappy system. It doesn't really evolved over the last, I think, 20 years or so. Um, anyway, so responsiveness is a, a big deal. Um, and the last one is resiliency, right? We need to make sure that our system is stable, can recover from issues, all that kind of stuff. We need to have it resilient um, because resiliency, um, uh, responsiveness without resiliency doesn't work. Um, users would see errors and re responsiveness without elasticity wouldn't work uh, if we need to scale up. 
So, right. So those two things uh, go into uh, responsiveness, um, but they also have like a connection between themselves. Um, without elasticity, I can't create resiliency because I need to have more services, more instances um, of the same thing to make sure that if one dies or fails, that I can just swap over. Um, it brings us to other things. Um, it's maintainability and extensibility. Um, that normally means uh, we need to make sure the system is still maintainable. And that is always a little bit of a trade-off, right? Um, the more services, the more instances, the more communication you have, the less maintainable system. Um, and the same go, uh, but the opposite is true. Um, if we have small pieces, we can easily extend them. Say, okay, we need another functionality. We just spin up another service. We don't have to update old technology. Um, and it also gives us the option to say, okay, if we use something like microservices, we can have very different languages using the best tool for the job, right? So all of that together kind of brings us to the point, if we want to implement something like that, one of the core concepts or one of the easiest ways to do that is a mess message-driven architecture. Um, so a message-driven architecture often comes with a, with, a, with a term that people call a data pipeline. A data pipeline is, is, is essentially three things. And can be a lot of things, right? But basically it's always a source, something where data comes from. So you have some input data, you have processors, translators, enrich enrichment, uh, stuff like that. So one or more data processors, and eventually you send it to a target. You normally say you sync it into something. Uh, it could be a database, it could be another topic, another queue. Um, it could be a printer if you want to, right? So in the, the simplest data pipeline is probably you have a Word document, you want to send it to the printer, so it needs to be translated to something the printer understands, and then it's being printed out. So that is basically what you can think of. Uh, the other thing that often comes with message-driven architectures is time series. A time series basically always looks like that. So you always have an x-axis of time and some y-axis of something else. It could be a temperature, it could be humidity, it could be invoice um, amounts, it could be um, stock, uh, stock prices, whatever you can think of. A time series basically always has the x-axis on time. Right. So as I said, it could be financial transactions, stocks, IoT metrics, observability data. So everything Prometheus, for example, e events, locks. And, and locks is often something people um, um, do not really consider time series. Sure, locks come in over time. Yes. OK. Um, but a lock message is, is, is not necessarily um, related to time. And I would say it often is. Yes, sometimes a single lock message can give you an answer to or can hint you at the problem exactly. But most of the time, it's like you have multiple lock messages pointing uh, plus the final one that gives you the actual error message that together tell you, oh, OK, so that is what happened. And that is what, what we ended up with, right? So you, we have a time relation. Those lock messages only make sense because we're in, in a specific order. Um, and the other thing that is very controversial is anything like invoices or stuff. I would also say those are time series in the sense of an invoice can only be refunded if it was actually created beforehand, right? You cannot refund, refund something that was not created. So you have the... The changes of invoices or the events that happens on invoices, they have an immediate time re uh, relation on time because there is some order, right? You cannot refund something that was already refunded, same thing. So that means it always looks something like that. You have some time, uh, you have additional metadata. In this case, it's an order ID, an offer ID, and a customer ID and stuff like that, right? So it's, it's very simple when you see a table which has like a main dimension of time, there's a good chance it's a time series. So let's let's go back to a few more terms in, in the sense of event 
driven architectures or event processing because when we talk about those things we need to send them right we need we have the 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 sync uh, the the source and the sync and we need to send data between those and there is like three different types of how you do that or how you can send those data right uh, that means we have to talk about delivery guarantees delivery guarantees mean how sure am i that my message reaches the other side and and how often does it reach it right so the the hardest but most obvious one is exactly once i want every message every event being sent from the source to the sync exactly once but that means that the sync needs to tell me oh yes i got that message so it's a little bit like a tcp round trip right you you make a connection to a tcp server the tcp server sends you a package waits for your acknowledgement and if you if, if if the source the server does not see the acknowledgement it expects the message to be failed and it will res oh, it will resend it the other one is at most once that's basically in fire and forget operation right you you send the message and you hope it's going to be received if not well whatever um many lock messages or lock message systems work like that like uh, syslock Syslog sends it out uh, on a UDP message. It expects it to reach the other side because there's a stable network in between. So we don't really have to do anything. Um, and the last one is at least once. At least once says the T or takes the TCP approach without acknowledgement and says, well, you know, let's be sure and just resend it. Um, many systems provide some acknowledgement uh, pro process to prevent too many messages from being resent. Um, but at least once is normally the, the thing that if you want to have a scalable event system, uh, you end up with, right? You send it, you wait for an acknowledgement. And if the acknowledgement um, does not come in, in in a specific time frame, you're just going to resend it. And it, it might not come in for a couple of reasons, right? The process might have crashed. Uh, there might be some error in the processing itself, like a bug in the code. Um, I mean, I heard the developers once in a while actually create bugs, um, stuff like that, right? So there, there could be a, a multitude of reasons why stuff happens. So when we, when we now consider that we sent messages potentially multiple times, um, and we expect something to not have an acknowledgement. So we we expect it just to send it like two or three times. Uh, we have to come up with a way on the other end, which is the receiving side, uh, to figure out, oh, there is something that I've already processed, so I don't have to do it again. And that is something that in, in technology is called item potency or item potency, uh, depending on where you are from in the world. And item potency is um, basically the concept of making sure that I can understand that I've done something before. It's not the actual technical definition, but let's let's go with that because the technical definition, you can always look it up on, on, on Wikipedia. It, it does not help you. So I imagine we have the consumer, we have our message thing in between our service and we have a database so the idea is you send the consumer sends a request and it sends the request with all the data the id and whatever uh but also adds an item potency key the item potency key often is something like a uuid something very very unique and the service can ask the database hey i have this item potent or i got this item potency key did we process that that request in the past is is that basically a duplicate, right? Is is that a recent message? And the database say yes, yes, we, we did that. Uh, here's the result from the last time that we stored, and you would send this last result back to the client or back to the consumer. The alternative is the client, uh, the the database says no, I don't know that yet. Um, so we send a store request, right? Uh, we we store the item potency key. Yes, we're gonna process that. We actually perform the request itself, and then we send back the record that um, we process somehow. So we have two different ways, right? We either know what happened or we don't, and we have to generate the results. So now we talked a lot about like how do we actually deliver stuff and and um, uh, what what is necessary to make sure that everything is is in order. 
Now, the next thing is, how do we actually get the messages from source to sync, from A to B, from data processor to, to data processor, right? And there is like three basic things. Um, I said we love to recreate terms and, and rebrand things. Um, so there is message broker, event broker, message bus, event bus, message queue, event queue. Um, I would consider a broker and a bus being kind of the same thing. A queue is a very specific kind of thing, but I know from experience, every time I say that, some people in the in the audience are like, ah, I, I don't disagree with your definition. Um, and I probably don't disagree, or I probably uh, wouldn't disagree with other definitions. It's it's really complicated. Some things mean have very slight differences. Some don't. Uh, to me personally, an event bus always gives me the the weird feeling of this like original event service bus. This like ten year, fifteen year old technology. The thing that got data from some magic place, sent data to some magic place, and did some magic transformation in between that nobody understood because the person writing the original transformation uh, wasn't with the with the company in like 10 years or so, right? Uh, it's basically the COBOL of event-driven architectures. Um, so I will use those terms kind of interchangeably, uh, kind of not. Um, just imagine they're kind of all the same thing. So... Uh, to deliver messages, um, and that is probably the concept that most people are familiar with, is publisher subscriber, right? You have some topic, you publish into the topic, and you subscribe to the topic and get the message out of that. That is like the the I think the oldest and the most common one. Um, Google made it really big with PubSub, Hubbub, uh, the 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 weirdest ever named service, but we know naming is hard. Um, the other thing is producer consumer. Um, from 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 my understanding or from my feeling, that mostly came in um, during the time of of Kafka or the beginning of Kafka. Kafka was like the first one really using those terms in a heart heart manner. Um, they're they're normally coming together these days uh, with queues. So while while a publisher subscriber has a topic, um, a producer consumer has a queue. And the difference between those things is that um, a topic doesn't need to prevent, uh, preserve order, right? It's it's a topic, you throw it in, and because topic often comes with the, like, um, either at least once or um, at most once, you may lose messages, you may get them in a different order because they have to be resent. Nobody cares. Whereas for a queue... Uh, we all know how queue works, right? It's a FIFO queue. It's a first in, first out. Uh, order is absolutely guaranteed. And order is absolutely guaranteed for every single consumer. Uh, really interesting thing, right? So, so here we can see that the order may be different. So looking at that in, in a broader scope, uh, we have the publisher and we have the message broker. I said I use message broker, message bus. I, I all use it interchangeably, so uh, it will change over the course of the slides, maybe. So it's a message broker, and we see two topics, right? So we have a topic here, and we have a topic here. Internally, those are the same topics, right? So I publish into one topic, and because I fan out, um, I, I'll, I'll end up with two different topics, one for, for each subscriber. And the interesting thing is that we can see that there is actually a difference in the order of the messages. So while it is, while we only have one publisher and, and publishing into the same thing, the order per subscriber may be different. And that can be a problem or it cannot. It really depends on what your application needs, right? If we um, look at what we did at, at, at my own startup, we looked at temperature changes, humidity changes. Uh, they only make sense if they come in in order, right? Uh, it's it, if you if you want to make some analytics or send out some warnings if a temperature is too high, it doesn't make sense to send out this or warning than say, oh no, the warning isn't valid anymore because some two two hours old message comes in that was totally fine. Um, just to send out, oh, there's another warning the next second after, right? For um, the producer consumer thing, it's kind of the same thing. We have a message broker in between. We have one producer. We end up, in, uh, we, we publish to the same queue, but internally it's gonna be split. 
Um, so you have one uh, one uh, queue per consumer. Um, but the important thing is we see that even though there are like two queues, the order of the messages is 100% guaranteed to be the same thing. Um, Kafka has something on top of that, which is partitions. Um, it's it's a little bit more complicated than that. Um, in, in, in Kafka, when you use partitions, you can actually say, okay, this is my partition key, um, like a device ID, and I want to make sure that all messages from the same device end up in the same partition, um, but are independent of other device IDs. So if something happens, some processing fails, I'm not blocking all of the system out. So um, there's one more thing um, that is interesting and and um you remember we talked about scalability and elasticity in the in the beginning so a lot of the systems have co uh, subscriber groups uh for um uh, uh um uh for the consumer version uh, it's a consumer group but it, the concept is the same thing um now you sub uh now your subscriber because bec becomes part of a group of a bigger group and the group itself is basically the subscriber to to the topic, uh, which means we we get a nice fan out of or a, a nice distribution of the of the messages. In this case, every subscriber just gets three of those six messages, which means we can have multiple instances and parallelize by actual processing. And that is where all the partitioning thing comes in uh, very handy because now you can say, okay, uh, I have multiple partitions and I have multiple consumers or, or subscribers. Um, just making sure that all the messages are processed. And when I see that my processing time doesn't work anymore because I'm not, I, I, I don't have enough processing time to, to keep up with the message flow because ingest is too high. I can just start up a third version or a third instance of the subscriber. And now everyone would get two messages, right? So there is a few um, implementations that are very common. Um, I've said Kafka a couple of times, but there's nuts, uh, which I personally think is a great implementation. Uh, it's, it's a single go binary, uh, very low latency, super cool stuff, um, provides uh, topics and queues. Um, it's it's a great implementation. It's much easier to use than Kafka. Um, you could certainly go for it. If you need a little bit of a longer storage um, and some more replaying capability, Kafka is still the way to go. Um, Redis queues um, gives you nice queue implement uh, gives you a nice queue implementation. Very nice order guarantee. Simple to use because it's part of the standard Redis uh, system. Um, AWS, uh, SQS, Kinesis, um, Amazon, Event Sub. There is a lot of those things. Every every cloud provider has their own thing. Uh, MQTT I think is really cool um, uh, because there's one major difference. MQTT comes from the IoT uh, system. That means it's optimized for millions and millions of queues, right? Uh, millions and millions of topics or queues. Uh, with Kafka, when you try to create a million Kafka queues, uh, Kafka will eventually die on you. Uh, it will probably not die in, in the terms of process death, but it will go down fairly quickly. Uh, whereas MQTT is designed for, you have a million cars on the street and every car has like three, five X topics. And, and MQTT just handles that really nicely. Uh, RabbitMQ, I don't think I have to say a lot about that. That's also very common, very uh, active um, uh, uh, queue implementation and topic implementation. Uh, one thing that from my perspective is very sad, ActiveMQ, which is, well, I mean, we're, we're in the Java world. ActiveMQ would be nice if they provide some better delivery guarantees some ordering guarantees, as far as I know, you cannot configure those. Delivery guarantees work, order guarantees do not. If somebody knows how to make ActiveMQ order guaranteed, I'd love to learn about that. Anyway, so let's uh, go quickly because I see we're already like 20 minutes in. Um, so let's get down to the actual patterns. That was already a lot of stuff that we learned, right? Um, but it we, we had to get it out of the way because everything that we just learned is necessary to understand how and why those things are important or how the actual patterns work in the end. So the, the, the first one is CDC. It's, it's the short version of change data capture. And it basically means you have some UI, something happens, um, somebody orders something, 
and we write it to the order uh, uh, to the database, right? So we have a table called orders and ignore the outbox table for now. We're coming back to that in a, in a later slide. Imagine for now we have the orders table. So we write something, uh, we, we get an order, uh, we create the order in the orders table and that's it. But in the end, what we want to do is we want to send out notifications. We want to send out an email, an SMS or anything like that, a WhatsApp message and let the user know, hey, we received your order. We received your payment. Uh, everything's in check. Um, we'll, we'll let you know when we send it out. Um, and we want to also generate an invoice and maybe send those invoices separately. I, I think everyone knows this concept. You order something and then it takes a minute or two until first like the order confirmation comes in and then the invoice or the invoice comes a little bit later when they send it out, something like that, right? And and the way it works is it's, it's always asynchronous. Those are independent services. Um, and that's why the notifications sometimes can take much, much longer. Um, and you wonder if your order was actually processed by the system. So the way it works is you need to do some magic uh, from the database to the service. So we, we have some magic to actually send it to an event queue. In this case, I'll, I'll just use Kafka. Um, and, and we have the uh, two consumers. Uh, one is the notification service. One is the uh, invoice service. Remember, those could be consumer groups, right? So we can have multiple instances of those. But the question is, what is that kind of magic? And that is where CDC comes in. Um, it's it's really interesting how you, how you can make that stuff work. Um, Sure, you could pull the table from some service over and over again and, and see if something happened, but that's not the best implementation. I'm not a big fan of polling solutions in general. So from a Postgres perspective, and I'm a big Postgres fan, but uh, there is kind of similar solutions for almost all databases, uh, especially MySQL, Oracle, all kinds of stuff, right? Um, so from a Postgres perspective, you have mutating operations, meaning making a change to the database. And that is either inserting something into a table, deleting something from a table or updating a row in itself um, by adding, I don't know, like a confirmation date or something. So the way it works is all of that goes into the so-called transaction log. Um, it, it works a little bit like in a file system like X4 or something. The idea is you write the change to the transaction log first, make sure the transaction log is, is, is actually synced down to disk. So we know the disk has written it to the physical or well with NVMe non-physical disk. Um, and the file system tells us, yes, I, I, I persisted this change. And then you go ahead and say, okay, I can submit this transaction. I know the transaction log has the information and I asynchronously can write it to the actual database table, right? The in-memory table. Uh, if something fails uh, and we all know that, uh, we have this like transaction log uh, replay, which basically means we restarted the database server. Um, it figured out that the data files and the transaction log is not in sync. So it will look into the transaction log and everything in there, which is not in the data files will be replayed into that. Um, for for Postgres, that is, thing is called write, write a hat lock. Um, it's, it's basically an append only data structure. So we end up, end up with something like an ordered list of all the changes in the database. Um, how this works in Postgres is, is really interesting because we have the tables, the three things on top. We have the query engine. We have the storage engine, the thing that actually writes the, the data files. The query engine is the stuff that reads the data files and executes your queries. Uh, we have the transaction log. And then we have something which is called a replication engine. And the replication engine is something which normally is, is used to connect two Postgres instances and say, okay, please send me all changes on the primary database so I can apply it on, on the secondary one, on the replica one. Uh, that is not often used for something like uh, read replica, so, so scaling out reads or high availability, fault tolerance, uh, failover systems, all that kind of stuff. The interesting thing is we can actually miss, well, misuse uh, the replication engine and say, you know what? I want to have something on my message queue. So on the right side, that's a message queue. 
And I use some CDC tool, some change data capture tool, which is most commonly Debezium. Um, I wrote something uh, at my time at uh, Timescale, uh, which handles the internals of Timescale much better uh, because, well, obviously uh, I was an employee. I had much more insight into how it works, uh, but most commonly Debezium is the tool to go with. And um, eventually I hope to to change, send some changes from, from my own tool to Debezium to make it more reliable for Timescale as well. So the way it works is the CDC tool connects to the Postgres server and says, you know what? I'm... I'm, I'm a different Postgres server. I want to get this replication log. Please give it to me, right? So what, what happens is the, the Postgres server sends us some data. And what we do is we receive those individual records like the inserts and deletes and, and updates. And we do some processing in the tool itself. And then we generate events. And generate events often means they... We, we take all data we have from this record, all the previous values, all the current new values, all that kind of stuff, which comes with the record and, and, and squeeze it into like a JSON data structure, an Avro, protobuf data stream, something like that. And we send that events, those generated events to the message queue. And now we have our uh, values inside of the message queue. We basically build ourselves a source, right? Um, we use the change data capture tool as the source, as you, if you if you remember the data um, the data pipeline picture. The other alternative is event sourcing, and that is a, a slightly different implementation of how you would actually do those things. So event sourcing still has something to do with the UI and the order and and whatever the person does, but instead of writing it down to a database first, it will generate. A, a stream of events. So we're we're not capturing the data from the database like in CDC, but we'd send it to an event store uh, immediately. An event store could be something like Kafka. Uh, I'm not saying use it as a database, but something that understands how events work, you store it into that. And eventually what it will do, it will give you two options. Event store will offer some replay capability. Uh, so with Kafka, you could say, okay, I have a bug. Um, I know what the system looked like specifically at the point in time at, I don't know, like this morning, 8 a.m. Um, and I want to replay everything that happened after 8 a.m. into my local instance, my test instance, and I want to see if, if I can reproduce the bug. It's a really cool thing. The other thing is most of the event stores also either implement an event bus or an event bus or connect directly to an event bus, right? Uh, or event broker, whatever you want to call it. So that means we generate the events in the UI um, and we send it immediately to the to the queue. Um, and after the event bus, there's some processing. Uh, we generate data, we generate some some kind of output, some kind of result, and we write it to a so-called read database. And the UI uses this read database to give you all the information. Um, something very common for those kinds of uh, setups. Um, is, for example, something like LinkedIn or YouTube. You you, you upload something um, and YouTube understands, well, I want to make sure that you see your change, uh, but I don't care if others see it immediately as well, right? So you, you send it to the bus. Um, in this case, the bus is often used for replication into different zones or different regions, and eventually everything will be updated. The third one is Outbox. Um, an outbox is what I said earlier, right? We ignore the outbox system. Uh, we have some request comes into a REST API. Uh, we have the orders table and the outbox table. And this time the outbox table is really important because what we do is when we have an order, we write it to the orders table and to the outbox table. So we're basically writing a command to the outbox table. We want to do something and we do this in the same transaction. That means if the transaction fails for some reason, it's going to be rolled back. Nothing will end up in the outbox which is cool uh, because now we have the guarantee that stuff actually happened or it didn't. And if it happened, we have to do something. Um, what I'm not a big fan of, and that is true for most outbox implementations I know, except for you use Debezium and CDC, uh, normally the publishing service, the thing that looks at the outbox table um, uses polling, Right? I said I'm not a big fan of polling. I think it's unnecessary overhead on the database. So what you want to do is build a publishing service that uses CDC or just use Debezium right away um, and, and use Debezium as your publisher and say, hey, please replicate all changes, all inserts in, in my orders table. 
and send them out to an event queue, right? So basically the publisher is the thing that sends it out. And then there is like a last one. I, I promise it's the last one. It's a really complicated thing. It's CQR as it's command query responsibility segregation. Apart from the term segregation, I think it's a, already a really bad thing, but segregation just makes it even, even more complicated. And now we're getting into the like, now we're on the height of engineering, right? Um, how over engineering do you want to do, or how over engineered do you want to do your system? Now we do not have just like one queue. Now we actually generate events into two queues, right? You remember uh, we we create a stream of events and we do something. Yes, uh, in this case we generate a query and or we have a query queue and we have a command queue. Uh, what does that mean? Well, we actually end up with two databases. So everything. Querying data, everything reading data goes to the query queue, everything write operation, mutate operation goes to the command queue. The way it works is something happens on the command queue. Um, imagine this arrow on the top as being the data pipeline. So we generate results or we, we write some, no, sorry, um, forget about that. The, the, the command queue writes to the write database immediately. So that means we, we have a command, uh, write it to the write database. And when we read something, we send it to the query queue, uh, that goes down to the read database. So now it's the question, how do we get data between, or sync between the write and the read database, right? And that is where it comes becomes really complicated because now we capture changes somehow on the write database. We have our data pipeline in between, right? So here we do the, the actual changes and the actual like calculation, whatever, um, and we use the read database as some kind of a materialization. So basically the read database does not have the raw information, does not have the commands. It only contains the results. We have no idea at that point how we came up with this result, but that is what we have in the end. Um, and we have to be uh, aware of the fact that it is eventually consistent, right? If your data pipeline restarts, if it's a little bit slower, if it can't keep up, uh, the write database and the read database will not be in sync in terms of what the number of commands is and, and how many stuff we, or how much stuff we calculated. And eventually consistent, I don't know how it is in, 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 in Chinese or stuff like that, or in a lot of other languages, but I'm German to me, eventually consistency is a really bad term because consistency sounds like the German word con, um, uh, eventually sounds like the German word eventuell and eventuell means possibly. So eventually consistency to me sounds more like it's possibly consistent. And that is exactly what it is, right? We, we don't know if it's consistent, eventually it will be, uh, but there's a high chance it's where there's a high probability it's not consistent right now. So uh, because we have to go a little bit faster, um, I'm running I, out of time, I think, whoops. Um, I created a little bit of a demo. Um, and this demo uh, uses a couple of things. Uh, everyone who knows me uh, uh, probably knows I'm a craver. I'm a, I'm a big craver for all kinds of Japanese food. Um, I'm a big fan of Japanese in general. So what I did is I used BuddyBase, which is a no, uh, a no code or low code platform for websites. Would I recommend using it? No. Um, I'm sorry. I, in general, I'm not a bit massive fan of of um, low code. I found I found it way too complicated. I think you can get very uh, efficient over time, but just for doing stuff, it was it was fun. I wanted to have something where it literally had no no code at all. So I have this like order system here. Um, I have N eight N, which is another uh, system. It provides workflows. Uh, can get data or can get uh, requests from different systems, can send them to different systems, can do translation, stuff like that. It's basically a, a, a bigger, better version of Node-RED. Uh, then I have something from Stripe because I need to listen to Stripe events. We're gonna use Stripe for payment. And I have my own tool, which is listening to the, to the timescale database on orders to capture those changes. So that's a CDC tool, right? The change data capture tool. And I have my mobile phone, which hopefully eventually we'll get some some order notification so um let's let's see what what I'm up for today uh, I know French toast is not Japanese but when I when that picture 
that is actually the best French toast I've ever had, and I had it in Tokyo. So I'll 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 consider that like the perfect Japanese food. Um, apart from that, I'm a big craver for takoyaki. Uh, just did them last week myself. Um, and because I'm German, I obviously have to add a beer, right? Um, being being German means I have to have beer. So let's do that. So we have the beer here. Um, I go to the basket. I should have free or uh, free items, and that's true. Um. Because I know that there are some other people um, in the room. Uh, let's order a few more. Uh, let's make it like 20 of all of those. 20. Yep. Um, and let's send the order. So that takes a second. Um, and I hope it works. I did not test it this morning. Oh, there you go. So now what we did, we created an order in the database uh, with, with this workflow. And my system is, there you go. My system was just thinking for a second. Um, with this workflow uh, that eventually went down to Stripe and say, hey, I need an order. Uh, I need a payment request. Oh, and I forgot to update. Uh, so I'm still paying. Nice. I ordered everything 20 times and I'm still paying for only one. That's good. Um, I want more of those. Um, so I'll, I'll just add something in here. Um, Stripe is nice enough to just give me this um, nice uh, Visa test credit card ID. And I can say, okay, I, I want to pay for that. And no, I do not want to save that. Um, and I see that Stripe sent me some 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 message. So now we have the Stripe web, webhook um, that does something in the database again. And eventually, if everything works out, there was a message in the event tool. So we're publishing some event. And we should see if Twilio works also. We should actually see something happening. Twilio, don't do that to me. Well, okay. It does not seem to work for whatever reason. The last the last item doesn't work. All right, fair enough. Um, there should be a, a notification here. And you see uh, demos, right? We all know that demos love to fail. Um, so let's consider it to have actually worked. It worked all the way up to the notification. And I don't know why right now. Uh, whatever happened. Anyway, so you remember that. Um, we let's let's quickly go back to that. Um, we have quite a few pi data pipelines, um, or we had quite a few data pipelines. So we had an ingress pipeline. We had to support multiple um, devices, and for some reason, ven device vendors don't think about the poor people on the other side that have to implement those. So every device has its own like data encoding, uh, its own data protocol. So we had to come up with something to kind of unify all of that for our internal processing. So basically um, those decoders do some magic to to generate, uh, to read the data out of the data protocol and, and uh, send it uh, down the, the pipe. Um, then we had a data pipeline and that was where we added additional metrics. We calculate additional things. We did like first analytics, stuff like that. It was basically, we got all the raw information from the devices and for certain, uh, of a certain collection of raw information, we could calculate something else or whatever. And eventually we wrote it down to the database, right? Um, and there's some more stuff because now we had all the events and we had the additional metrics and stuff like that. Um, so one interesting thing, for example, for us was to see our devices regularly sending data. Uh, is a device offline or is there some issue? Um, so that is where that comes in. Um, eventually, if a device goes offline and you realize that, okay, it does, didn't send anything for like the last 10 minutes or so, uh, you're gonna generate an alarm to let people know, oh, you know what? You want to make sure that um, this is actually fixed or you want to fix that. Um, and then there were some other things. Uh, the last one was actually a webhook pipeline. And that is basically just like everyone else, uh, we were able to send our data onwards. So we had partners that did their own analytics, uh, their own additional calculations on top of that. So whenever we had an event, we were able to just send it out. And we were basically the aggregator of all the different devices, all the different services that we pulled for for data, uh, we we standardized it uh, or we we brought it, we aligned it basically, and then we were able to send it down to partners. So um, the problem is, and that is the last slide, 
there is a lot of trade-offs. Um, for, for a small company, that is not a simple system. That's not a simple architecture. And it was not our first implementation. That was, I think, the third or fourth implementation of it. Uh, and it was basically a rewrite from scratch over and over again. Uh, there is a lot of complexity when you bring in event-driven architectures, but they have uh, use cases. For us, it was more important to have the scalability per specific thing um, for example, you have different numbers of device, different devices out there. Uh, for one device, you only need a single instance of a service to to decode the protocol. For the other ones, you have millions uh, of devices out there, so you need a couple of more instances. Uh, for us, it was really important to do that, uh, and it gave us the option to um, to change the system or add new devices, add uh, analytics in in hours and days instead of weeks and months. So um, I think we have maybe uh, one minute left for questions. I'm sorry, I almost used all of, uh, used up all the time. <laughs>